Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Eyes 10.00. And you guys are the only ones that can really help me grow the channel. I mean, I do things, post on different um, uh, forums and what, but. Um, I know not many people viewed on the video or on the AAR forum for videos, but basically my thumbnails are just a little too um, swastika y for them nowadays, and so I'm probably not going to be doing that there um, anymore. But. And yeah, I can improve my quality, edit things more, do stuff more, whatnot, to make the videos more popular. But what that really is, is to make people either hit that like button more, comment below more, um, share the video, com get it, tell a friend. Alex plays has been another hero. He's brought at least one person over to subscribe to the channel. So yeah, try to try to um, help me out, please, please. I mean, I'm just so grateful that you're even watching. Trust me, I I know that I am. But um, telling a friend um, really helps grow the channel, even if they're not going to be a daily watcher. Just more subscribers helps. Okay. We have earlier um, had, and I know I've done redone the images for this. Again, I still wish I got rid of that. I'm afraid if I get rid of that banner now for this, or not the banner, but the frame for this now, it will mean I have to restart. Okay. Um, earlier, but uh, the first, second, and third Standard and SS token for bound death head, SS death head unit um, three battalions. Okay, important. This division has a long event chain and upgrade. So be aware that removing units or re renaming any of the brigades will stop these events from occurring. So because what they'll do is have a check in there. Does division whatever or does brigade whatever exist not just the overall division but the actual brigade exist and if that answer is yes then at other conditions the event will fire if the answer is no maybe you've done something like deleting it or renamed it um, but also if you've lost it in combat that's what some of the original reasons for some doing stuff was done then you won't have the thing okay the NSDAPAO um, in India this is the National Socialist German Workers Party Ostgruppe Calcutta the AO and um, Ausland organization English foreign organization um, and it, membership was only open to German and German national. Define them differently than saying, you know, a Austrian national who is a German ethnicity. Basically, most all Austrians or state and Germans or others. So this is only people like carrying German documents in good standing, living in, in foreign countries. I am sure at some level all of these organizations would have been accurately described as, which if you look at stuff I was just watching, sort of the intro to Background to Danger, badly titled movie from 1943. It's sort of to be like another sort of Casablanca type spy feature thing set in Turkey. But yeah, um, they did sort of a... Um, introduction kind of thing for that you know fifth columnist kind of thing was sort of the term um yeah there's definitely some of that but it's also um you know in fifth column every nation to some degree you know has a um you know make sure that people are 
helping out the interests of their nation, you know, uh, uh, befriending local business people to do business with your country or whatever, you know. There's always that going on. Not, and this wasn't, and obviously this is very open, that they have a, a P.O. box in, in Calcutta in British territory, and they, they you know, um, uh, the printed um, letterhead here um, is out of date, so they've crossed out the older person's name and put in the newer person who, who's sending the, the letter. But, um, you know, this isn't like a hidden organization. It's partially to do, you know, both above board and below board, if you will, open or, you know, approved and unapproved type stuff. The sort of fifth column, this, this just happens to be India, but um, I thought this was sort of an interesting letterhead. I didn't know they had one when I found this out here in India. But it's also to maintain a watch over German nationals when they're outside of Germany. that That's a critical part. Now, of course, you have Jews, which are German nationals that are fleeing. And then you have known socialists and communists that have fled some of those types, um, including some of the Jews, go fight in like the Spanish Civil War. And so some of them are, you know, openly carrying arms. Others, like a lot of people that end up in Hollywood, um, Marlena Dietrich, um, to name just one, and I'm picturing a few other faces, but I'm not coming up with the names right now, um, including several of them that starred in Casablanca, were German nationals that um, well before the war breaks out have basically um, ended their association with anything modern sort of German national socialistic, you know, just it all sort of sucks. So those people were obviously kept note of, nothing happened to the, you know, the high profile people, but just to sort of make sure that if you're come, if you're around there, are you behaving appropriately while you're, you know, um, outside of Germany? And if not, well, we'll remind you to behave appropriately. And if you ever do come back to Germany, you'll get reminded too not to behave inappropriately overseas. So we lose some supplies, lose a little money, sort of not just there. Okay, um, government, we're going to continue the war ministry. Still the 50 50 chance. Yes, number three air bases. That's mostly just a reminder to come and do this. I believe the AI version of that just puts them on the map, but they don't get the benefit of the practicals. Um, Comrade Veidt, that's who I was thinking of, who played a bunch of roles, often as Nazis. Um, he played the sort of um, the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe um, colonel. I know they're they're not really called colonels, but um, in uh, Casablanca, um, forget the character's name right offhand. And a bunch of other roles. Uh, often as bad guys, even when not specifically um, talking about Germany. Okay. Um, Soviet Union has an excess of cash. Would they lie now like a little bit of supplies? We are. I'm not. I've cut it already in half. Um, not so much worried about right now. Oh, no, that's too much. Yes, yes. We'll go down there. Um, losing some money, but I don't want to have this go forever and just bleed all my money out. And again, those of you who I know, there's some just watch an occasional video. Those of you, you know, heard me objecting to the difficulty with their, um, you can come over here and click and see it. The, uh, the strategic effects here. They still show up in the game from what I've done. 
but you can no longer trade for them because I have made no well that's just the garrison things but um, I have made um, the trading thing not happen and the AI was attempting to do this which was making it difficult to trade with other nations um, I think inappropriately and <sighs> You know, prefab shit. The, yeah. Um, on two levels, I disagree with this. Again, one, and in, in, <clears throat> the U.S. wanted trade with Germany, and and there's various trade missions going on during this time leading up to um, thirty nine, and things really going bad. So the U.S. was particularly trying to trade with Germany partly just to get its money back because what the way it was sort of working was is u.s businesses would buy something from germany and sell it in america and make a profit that would mean germany would get american dollars germany would then of course one confiscate those american dollars from the german company that sold the thing but give them reichmarks in return you know, not stealing the money so much, but definitely once that money hits the German, there's massive currency controls about one taking just German currency out, but two um, in Germany buying foreign currencies and taking that out. Massive controls on that. And I don't have the details on it. I don't know that I've ever looked up, but I do know that um, some of the people that... Um, talked about I've read biographies or, um, or autobiographies or... Um, what's um not so much journals but whatever reminiscences or something we talked about pre-war trips around europe that they some of the reasons they were bicycling and whatnot around europe was just because they didn't have enough money that they could take out it's not that they couldn't afford it from their job in germany but to go to france or to belgium or to italy or something uh they couldn't exchange very much money so it's like, oh, yeah, you know, in the modern day sense, <clears throat> well, you can have $200, you know, equivalent, and go bicycling around France in modern day equivalent. That's what, a night or two in a hotel? In a sort of, yeah, no, they, it's, it's like pitiful amounts of money. You hardly can spend it. Really serious problems on that. So, um, yeah, they would confiscate, say, the U.S. dollars. I mean, it was all set up. It, confiscation sounds like they'd show up at the business and take the money. Oh, no, it was just taken at the bank level when it um, comes in. And so, and then the German, you know, would, the companies would give them the Reichmarks. And then if the company say, well, I need to buy, well, I'm just going to go, I mean, it probably wouldn't be steel from the USA. But, oh, we need to buy some particular mineral from the USA. Oh, and you need dollars? Oh, okay, here's, you know, and if it's all go through the approval process, okay, here's some dollars back to go buy something from the USA, you know, some from some company. They would do that, yes, but you had to get permission, especially on any sort of industrial scale. Um, you had to get permission to do that. But they wanted to take the foreign currency, give you local currency, and then use that those dollars to repay the loans that the U.S. gave to Germany so that Germany could um, pay the um, war debt from World War I, you know, the, um, the um, reparations from World War I. So, yeah, um, the U.S. wants that system to keep going because they want to get paid back. They want the other nations to get their reparations to keep the sort of international business going. So the U.S. is not trying to hate on Germany for trade reasons. Okay. That's one. And so it should, I'm entirely agreeing with the idea that it should take ICs away from either building more ICs or away from uh, building units or equipment or whatever you want to call it or other things to simply make consumer goods or supplies in this case, and selling them for money. Um, 
So take away from the war buildup, as it were, to help fund the imports. I'm all for that. The other part with these here is um, these you will still get. And you notice is um, is controlled by Germany or controlled by member of the Axis. So if you're, um, you know, so you, this is, I look at this as more critical. Um, like, I don't know that Belgium, because that's one of the places, but Elizabethville, I don't know where Hay River is. Um, you at United States, maybe? I don't know. Um, I guess we could look that up. Not going to right now, but um, it is not necessarily going to, Belgium is not necessarily going to sell out a lot of its uranium to just some random country for money. But once they're in the Allies and the Allies need uranium for nuclear research, absolutely. So this is sort of, you've got to either, you've got to directly control these um, critical uh, resources, aluminum, and one of these is in Hungary, I believe. Um, Paramando, I think Gora is the third sort of down. Um, so, you know, because we're we, the trade modifiers won't kick in um, with this. But so you get hungry into the axis, then yes, you open up its aluminum fields more directly as opposed to just simply buying rare materials from Hungary. So, yeah, um, I think a closer alliance, something that um, equates to one of the three factions in this game that's required to to get that um, effect. That is one of the reasons I don't know. Let's quickly look here. Um, well, we have um, tungsten there, definitely, and where the work. Okay, and we also have tungsten here. And I definitely know. Um, I think it's underdone in um, parts of iron for the lack of tungsten in Spain. I've read about. Um, maybe I should have contact. I should have looked into it earlier on, but. Um, read about the neutrals a book dealing with the neutrals in world war ii and um both sides were were both um, portugal and spain were um trying to mine as much tungsten as they could it's with the w for wolfram here but um you see that's oh it's called tungsten out there but it's also known as wolfram um as much as they could during the the war um germany was trying to buy every last bit it could britain particularly in portugal um didn't really need it not that it couldn't use it but didn't really need it but was buying as much as it could and couldn't necessarily ship it out because they were using the ships for more important things so um large warehouses were filled with tungsten, um, refined or semi-refined um, tungsten in Spain or in Portugal, waiting to be shipped to Britain. And the British were just going to, yep, yeah, we'll pay pounds just to keep it out of Germany's hands, just to keep it out of Germany's hands. Now, according to the book, um, neutrals in World War One or something like that, dealing with some of the major neutral nations in Europe, Switzerland, Sweden, Spain and Portugal, I think, mainly. Um, a lot of uh, the Spaniards were sort of um, cruising across this border in sort of the rougher terrain areas and um, prospecting and getting as much um, tungsten as they could and bringing it into Spain and claiming it was from Spain, sort of a pirate mining operations, as, as it were. But so whether they should or shouldn't have this i think they should have um a tungsten in spain generally speaking as a uh, uh 
benefit, but I could be wrong on that. Definitely Portugal is a major one. And so getting Spain, somebody like Spain or Portugal into the Axis, and I'm going to come down here if they have a, a real modifier of something. No, it doesn't look like it down in Mozambique. Getting them into the Axis and not having them go into the war come into the war directly can be very useful just for that and just maybe for the tungsten effect if there's not none other around for them to get so yeah that's some of the reasons why you just want to get people into the you know nations into the axis without necessarily going yeah declare war declare war when the war starts just yeah hey chill keep it peace okay the Nectar S. Stelling Fortress was built. Okay. Um, Baden and Wurttemberg ran for Nightbox. Okay. Pillbox, Hellborn, Marshback. Okay. Yes. Well, I'm not even going to bother looking that up. Let's keep things going. I know. I know. I talk too much. I wonder what I'm supposed to cut, cut out of this. Just this clock going here for a few seconds without me talking until this pops up. Or do I just cut out all these little technical things of brigade command and brigade command structure advance. Oh, that is here. Okay. Yeah, we'll let you continue going. I really don't know, quite honestly, how some of these improve from what it was before. I don't know. Maybe if it was explained to me slowly, I could get better how adding some of these. Yeah, um, brigade command structure, divisional command structure, and core command structure is an important thing. I'm not going to deny that, downplay that. I just don't know how that works out. Okay, yes, we're going to go with all four of these. I'm going to be careful not to double click anyone because I'm not trying to cheat. Yes, so it will either, if there's something it needs to remove, it will remove it. You can see here very well all the removed brigade. It may have been looking for that. Sometimes these are just forming a unit, so it would be the first one. So yeah, we're losing those. Um, Right, okay. Um, okay, we're definitely going to move the Turpits and the Graf Zeppelin down, because I... Not that I don't want those, they're just not the main sort of plan. I want some heavy cruisers. Okay, you know, um... I did check, it is in 37... If you get over 480 ICs in this number, you start to get the bad effects. And as you get more and more ICs over that, it gets worse and worse for the bad effects. So you don't want to go over 480. So we can see like propaganda press is negative, totalitarian system is negative two, Warecrest system one is negative 2%, I should say. And Eisenbaum canon program. That's the Railway Cannon Program, 2%. TRE Pioneer Program, that's building the West Wall, negative 3%. Four-year plan from TRE is plus 10%. Reich Economics is uh, 15, building manufacturing plants. Yeah, and I could change. I could go in and get rid of that, the underscore there, and give it a better name, but just more work for me. Um... Building air bases is down 5% industry. So, um, yeah, we're already pressing up to there. Okay, got to keep that in mind. So we're not going to expand to more than we currently are building right now. And it is, I think, 650 for 38 and 39. There is, um, it's the, it doesn't go up more from 38 to 39 in the um, amount of ICs you can have. Once you hit the war starting going in 40, I think, or whatever, um, you can um, build as many ICs as you want. 
to sort of on the premise, yeah, you're going to be not building units and building ICs. We'll go ahead, but. You don't get to just spam the ICs beyond this. Okay, so. We've got those units coming in. That's going to be a bunch of stuff building, which is going to get them off. Um, they're letting us build motor torpedo boats again. Now, last time I played this, motor torpedo boats had been removed from being able to be built and they were just given by events. So I guess they've changed things now. Okay, well. That'll give us four motor torpedo builds, 73 days. Four ICs, very good. We've got a lot, but let's just build two more coastal subs. Just to start, get them built fairly well. We didn't actually hit the button, did we, for the like, torpedo boats? There we go, start production. Um, just to start building up practicals and... Coastal tor uh, coastal submarines are still useful. Um, trust me on that. If they get done before the war, I can just put them down somewhere like in the Mediterranean and have them function down there quite effectively. Um, right. And so let's let's build a couple of twin-engine fighters. Now, yeah. Well, let's. Let's start with practicals on regular fighters because it'll be a little cheaper. Yeah, a little quicker too. So we'll get those going in our production line. All right. We already have a bunch of divisions here. Um, well, some here, a bunch more up here. Including a lot of regular subs and some coastal subs. Four engine transport prototype has advanced. Very nice. Um, let me, mm, let's go light bomber first. Now I do like the idea that they have light bombers, medium bombers, heavy bombers. That does add to the game, like I was just saying before. Having, just adding in, you know, some of those command structures now for the brigades, divisions, and corps. Definitely, I want incremental um, improvements to things. Okay, armor unit training advance. Well, that is here. Switch that down to there. All right, here. Um, yeah, I have. N I, this is basically where I stopped working on the mod, and I've never added the text in. I'm just partially a job of trying to get it translated from the original. Uh, and I forget who, and I know I thanked before the person who, who actually went out and bought the magazine, and he was in Germany, and or bought it online, um, and then scanned it in for me. Yeah, he thought it was cool to own, too. A bit of a collector, I gather. And presumably, if ever he wishes to, he could sell it for the roughly the price that he bought it for. But he scanned it very nicely. And, and so um, this is a 1937 uh, Berliner Illustrated Zeitung, um, Berlin Illustrated Magazine, basically, is what that means for you Americans. I know what the German. I know the Germans if they understood my bad German. German, what it was. Um, cover story about um, the guy I think driving the car, going to uh, Palestine, and um, covering the Jewish 
Arab conflict. You may recognize that's the guy who eventually shows up in Germany and is Himmler and Hitler meet with, and, you know, sort of the Muslim guy that, I forget his name, um, he come to me eventually. So they're already in contact with him. I, I think this whole thing is, I think, I don't know. A lot of records, a lot of stuff has been destroyed. So I say I think and not know, but I think the guy who's doing this story is making initial contact for Germany, shall we say, I don't know, for a particular intelligence organization, but making contact. Now, they also contacted the Jews there, too. Um, some interesting stories with what was going on at this time with the Jews. There, are, I won't go into it too much, but there is thought within some Nazi circles of, yeah, let's just dump all of our Jews into um, Palestine as a solution. Um, not that it's like, oh, well, it's the Nazis really like the Jews. No, 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 no. They just hadn't quite mentally got to the idea that we're just going to exterminate them yet, or at least some of them hadn't. Um, so this is, I'm looking at as evidence of contact pre-war with, um, Islamist fundamentalists. He doesn't specifically, um, form the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, but it's the same sort of strain of, of elements. And mother Muslim Brotherhood is, I think, formed, um, around this time during the war, slightly after the war. Okay. And so it's covering sort of Britain's Das Palestine. The uh, problem of the pal the problem of Palestine. Uh, I'm talking about how they're doing. The Jews are coming in um, and buying land secretly, and then um, you know through an agent, you know from some Arabs without telling them that it's Jews buying the land, and so they're they're buying the land at whatever the market price is. And then they sort of all arrive with sort of somewhat prefab, you know, homes to quickly um, build into the area and get settled in before they could be stopped. Um, uh, they put palisades around them, you know, wooden, fill it with sand to stop bullets from Arab attacks. There, those are some of the uh, at some of the Jewish militiamen. Notice, notice this photo. I know I've talked about this before. You're looking down on these guys. I don't think it's an accident. It makes them look smaller. There's light focused on them, but it's at night, like they're fugitives or rats or something like that, hiding in the darkness, that they're being exposed. Just keep that in mind here. That's the photo and the, the thing. The article isn't hyperbolic on its language about the Jews. Um, a bit about how, and he's sort of sitting on the hood here for this photo, I think, but how they, to not be attacked by the Arabs, they fly the Nazi flag. So the Arab tribesmen out in the wilderness that they're riding around in this Mercedes or whatever, they're worried because they're Europeans and they might be sniped at by, shot at by the tribesmen out there who might think that they're British. But the tribesmen know that this flag is a Nazi flag and, well, we don't shoot at the Nazis, of course. The Germans, the Nazis, however. You want to look at this. Okay, now um, talk about sort of a rally they went to. And yes, I'm reusing this photo and all the, the stuff to emphasize that. But look at this photo of this guy on a horse. Okay, now you're looking up at him. Yeah, you could all go, hey, they were probably in the car, truck, whatever, taking the last photo. This, they happen to be standing on the ground and he's up on a horse, but it's on a photo. He's carrying, uh, or it's, it's on a horse, looking up at him. He's carrying a flag. It's much more of a, you know, look at that shot. That, that it could be Alexander the Great or somebody, that kind of heroic pose. And they're picking out this heroic person, not maybe one of these little less heroic looking guys in the background. This just on those two photographs is how things are framed. Both these photographs, um, oh, they may be staged. You know, can we get a shot of you guys over here in the light? You know, the militiamen, the Jews. And oh, can we, can we get some of you guys on horses so that we can take some photos? You know, maybe staged at that level. 
certainly. But I'll grant that these very well could be very real just photos taken of what was happening. But it's the way they were taken and it's the way they were published that sets the frame framing of the the propaganda. And um three Jews, two Arabs dead, one Jew, three Arabs wounded, dead and wounded in twenty four hours. They're talking about the ongoing um violence going on between them here. And I call it I'm I use the different terms as um, like Palestine or Israel, um, more time specific than anything else, because this was the Palestinian mandate at the time. That's why we're calling it this. So we can spend five for fifty money and three hundred supplies. Basically, I'm looking at some arm, secret arms shipments down there, um, and they'll get um, uh, some revolt risk around some of this area. Or we could do nothing and leave them alone. Well, we're going to support them. Now, I have no evidence, no evidence that Germany was giving money and or weaponry. And especially, I don't have any evidence of, say, um, modern German weapons showing up in that region. Now, German weapons dating from World War One. well, they gave a lot of those to Turkey, and that was sort of the war down there. So there's probably some of that being left around. Um, okay, General Goering event. Okay, um, keep Goering happy. We give lose a little supplies of manpower, and he gets a flak regiment. So this is sort of the start, and we'll do that. Sort of the start of sort of the Hermann Goering event division chain. Okay, to uh, cop inspectorate. Good. We want to put that under that, and do we have oh. Um, um, he probably was in charge of the, um, oh, we'll just know leader, um, in charge of first standard, day. first standard, but let's, um, sort back by name. But he's also the inspector, so we'll just move him there. And no, that's the thing. Can we not get the. Well? Huh? I'm just somehow missing it there. That's the watch trip thing. Huh? Oh, is it in the production queue? That could happen. It could be. Yep, there it is. There it is. It's in the production queue. This is why you watch the channel to see me fiddle around with things and figure things out. But you also get to learn. If you want it done quickly, move it to the top of the queue. Okay, infantry unit command and control advance. Very good. That's now 38. So, um, yeah, let's move to mobile. We'll get to some of these here. Often I do, like, artillery first because basically all units use artillery. You know, all divisions use artillery. But not all divisions use infantry units because some of them use mobile. You know, um, units instead of the these infantry, or some of the, not all use armor, you know, because not all armor divisions, but they just about all have some sort of artillery attached to them, all proper divisions at least. Oddball garrison stuff, like you know, that no, but yeah, somebody stole some of our blueprints. I hope it was a friendly. Okay, um, Frank Battles Czech Police, um, during a speech by Conrad Headline in the local theater in, um, 
Teplis, Teplis, I don't know, town in Czechoslovakia, the Sudeten Deutsches Party leader, Karl Frank, provoked a conflict with government officials. Frank battled the Czech police um, assistants present, uh, present at the meeting. So basically, he's causing trouble. Um, basically, that little pin you can barely see there, I think it's more or less that pin, and that's supposedly the rally or whatnot so germany gains threat on czechoslovakia okay this is all part of the four-year plan that's das um four-year plan magazine in letters you know written out instead of in numbers um just sort of use that as an excuse here to um gain a little bit more organization and a little bit popularity for what's going on you're getting a job from the four-year plan it's making germany stronger the four-year plan Germany's developing the four-year plan, all, you know, praise the Hitler and the Nazis kind of thing. Also remember, the best propaganda is true propaganda. But propaganda is framing something in a particular light, not, you know, unbiased information. So... You have to always keep that, including what I what I say, armored um, spearhead advance. Um, okay, that's grayed out. Yeah, let's do division command structure. Like I really see communism and Nazism, but ain't communism in a negative light. So I think everything I'm saying about communism is more or less true, but it is very much from. Um, my perspective. This is a smaller um, Volksbahn NSSAP National Socialist Schweizerisch Arbeiters Partei. Um, so it's not the big, the main um, uh, national front. Um, oh, so I, um, I think made up of some former National Front members. I'm not going to. And but what's sort of interesting about this is this postcard that was sent in. Um, and these had to be are printed in Germany because there's a swastika white one under there. But the Swiss postal officials stick on these four sort of censoring stamps on the outside of the, and it's on a postcard, so it's on, obviously both sides are on the outside. Um, in As it's going through the mails, it comes in. So they're censoring that, um, letting it through, but censoring it. And Switzerland got a an event about that so if you happen to be playing in switzerland what are you doing playing in switzerland i don't know but they also did that there was the main national front or the yeah i think the front national if i'm not mistaken the national front is the nazis the front national is the french fascist and then there's the italian fascist movement okay infiltration and tactics advance and those three groups are trying to pull off uh, Where what? One thing, spearhead doctrine plus one. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay, yeah, we'll let that continue. I think we're going to end this episode here. See you next time for more. Yes, more parts of iron. Oh.